but that brings me on to um, Marita's question, which was, I'll go to, I'll go to stop placement and risk sentiment before I go to, um, sorry, I'll go to stop placement and risk management idea. And then I'll go into uh, gold and then risk sentiment. So Marita was saying earlier about a, um, the fact that she's stop placement. And what's happening is, is that she's being caught and then the market is going in her direction. So the general, the general rule of thumb and what I was told when I first started trading, um, you know, uh, with my mentor is that he said, put your stop in a place where you will be wrong, where you'll be wrong about the trade 100%. Yeah. So that means pretty much having a wider stop. Now, obviously the, um, the downside to that is you have a wider risk, but you, that means that your risk reward, you know, price has to, price has to go further um, in order for you to achieve a decent risk reward. But you really have to maybe think of ma risk management if you can't, if you don't like taking losses. Now, I have, um, I wouldn't say no problem taking losses. I don't like taking losses like in, like the next person, but I understand um, that I have. When I, whenever I do get into a good trade, I'm going for, you know, 10, 15, 20 to one type trades. Yeah. So to me, I've accepted that um, risk reward as far as losing a few trades um, really doesn't matter to me, if you know what I mean. Um, but if you are one of those people that, you know, still are, um, uh, still don't like taking the loss, then my thing would be to say, put your stop loss in an area where you definitely be wrong, definitely be wrong. So not just maybe necessarily maybe 10 pips above a structure, depending on obviously the time frame that you're trading on, the average person will put their stop loss. It's very rare that, you know, from a lower time frame perspective that traders are having, for example, a 30 pip stop, even on an hourly time frame, you won't really get hourly time frame traders placing their stop loss you know, 30 pips above the market. You know, they'd, they'd normally, you know, try and place their, you know, maybe 10, 15, possibly max 20 pips. It's very rare that you'll get someone place their stop loss 30 pips above above the market. So um, I would say where makes sense to you, if you know what I mean, where makes sense in this whole structure would the trade definitely be over? Now, if I was answering that question based on here, it would have to be above the supply zone. It would have to be above this area here for me to think that this, this whole trade, this whole trade idea, as far as getting short on the, um, on the Euro and buying the dollar is definitely over. It would be above supply. But then again, depending on your entry, you know, are you really going to risk nearly 200 pips if your account size is you know is, is quite small for example if you can't necessarily manage it this is just a function of your percentage anyway so it doesn't really matter about you know how many pips you're risking it more matters about what does this represent as a percentage of your accounts and i understand that not everybody can have you know or has an account size that can or, or the amount of leverage that can um uh, uh, represent, you know, 200 pips can only represent, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0.4% of your, of your trade. So then you have to then make a decision, which leads me on to my next point as to the trade idea, right? So the trade idea, how, how much are you going to allocate on this trade idea? So what I um, keep in mind is I will keep in mind that on any single trade idea as far as getting short at a level yeah i'm you know willing to risk you know upwards of maybe you know let's say for example one percent yeah one percent on this whole zone yeah because i don't know where the turning point is going to be could it have been there could it have been there could price could price have come back and gone higher into the zone and then reversed None of us know. Nobody knows for certain. Yeah. So 
what I suggest, and this is what may help you, Marita, is whenever you have a trade idea or you have a level or a zone that you're looking at, let's say, for example, you want to allocate 2% of that, of your, of your total capital on this one zone. Divide that up into, you know, let's say, for example, five or six trades, if you can. So what you're saying is, is that you're willing to get in five times at, um, you know, point, what is that? Point five or point four or something like that. Yeah. Point four percent per trade or thereabouts. Yeah. Cause you're going to take five trades around this area and just manage your risk that way. So that if you're wrong about this whole area and prices continue going to the upside, at least from a risk management standpoint, you've only lost 2% of your total capital. That makes sense? Yes. <clears throat> yes, it does. Yeah. So um, you're not wrong. You're, what, what, what I commend you on is the trades that you were saying was, was, was that, you know, you literally got picked out and then prices went in your direction. So yeah. it's, just, it's literally just a case of stop being in the obvious and maybe a bit too tight, you know, being obvious. But then also saying to yourself, if you had maybe taken one more trade, you would have made back that money and more, right? Right. And that, that's happened a couple of times where I maybe entered twice, still didn't, you know, go my direction. But if I would have on a third one, it would have. Yeah, so exactly. there's something, I, I know it's my stops are too tight. How, what makes a stop too tight? Can you um, explain that a little bit clearer? Uh, again, none of us know. So, so I would say a too tight stop loss may be an obvious, and I guess maybe saying it's too tight is, is more hindsight bias because if had those trades have worked, then it, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking about your stop being too tight, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because you wouldn't, you wouldn't want true. So it's so it's more of a hindsight bias thing um, when we talk about the stop loss being too tight. So, like for example, me, I will put I will have my stop loss anywhere depending on the pair between um, you know on 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 my entry would be you know anywhere between five to fifteen pips. Now I know that I'm going to get caught on some of those trades, but again because I'm prepared to go in, you know, several times then I'm not worried about losing two or three or four times because if I'm going to be right on this trade and I get in somewhere around here and I have a really tight stop and I have some really good risk reward to the downside. And that's another thing as well that you have to kind of be aware of is don't, don't take, you know, don't take four losses. Yeah. At let's say for example, 0.1% yeah, or 0.2% or whatever it is. And then the one trade that you get into yeah, you're only going for a two to one. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make no sense. You have to try to let the, the, the winning trade run for at least more than what you've lost. Okay. Yeah, because, because that is, that is going to be the key. That is going to be the key to this. This is the key to growing your account, period, is, is letting those 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 um those runners win if you know what I mean or those winners run I should say <laughs> runners win but um well, either way but it, it's 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 that that's going to grow your account you know it's because and then you don't necessarily have to worry about win rates if you lose four you make one but on that one you made a ten to one and you lost four you're up six and again, nobody knows. There are going to be times where you might take, but remember you've accepted as well. Again, the key to this is that you're, you've accepted that I'm going to take 1% or 2% in this whole area. So if you lose your full 2%, that's fine. There was just 2% that you lost on this one trade idea. Did you break even on this? Yeah, no, whatever it is, but you have to just let the chips fall where they may and manage your risk. You've got to stay in the game, as you know, as long as possible, you know, and, and not try to, you know, potentially get rich quick. But, um, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, but um, it's all about risk management. 
rather than um, you know trying to risk it all on one or two or three particular trades, if you know what I mean. So being wrong is okay. We're all going to be wrong, but it's just when you're right, just make sure. And again, just going back to fundamentally and sentiment wise, if we know fundamentally this is potentially a bargain price and the market agrees with us, then why wouldn't it go there? And I'm not saying that, you know, any kind of certainty or anything like that. It's just, we have a probabilistic nature, you know, if we're right and we've done a fundamental analysis that it should want to go down to the lows. Can I ask another question on this very chart that you have up? Yep. So the, you see where price entered your supply zone the first time that mm -hmm. would be considered a stop hunt, right? Because price, ended up going down, but then it reversed and went back up, right where you have the top of your value. Yep, I know line. what you're talking about, yep. Okay, so that would be, that first one would be considered a stop hunt, correct? Right, now, I, I was talking to, uh, I think it was Maxwell, I made a video for Maxwell the other day about stop hunt setups. Now, stop hunts happen everywhere, yeah? Stop hunts will happen absolutely everywhere. But what we're concerned with is how the stop hunt looks to the point where we can get involved in that stop hunt. Yeah. So, so as the example, here's an example of this is, and I totally get your point. So first of all, the first kind of rule for stop hunting is that there must be an obvious level. There must be an absolutely obvious level that everyone is looking at. And in, in recent history, we have one, two, you know, and then we get, I guess if you kind of stretch this down a little bit, there would have been three. Not there, yeah, probably just, just a little bit, not as, not as accurate. You really want it to kind of touch, but generally in this area, there would have been some sort of um, support and resistance zone. So the level is, is fairly accurate if we're looking at it, you know, from pretty much this perspective. Let's just draw that accurate line there. There. Very, very accurate there. Ping, ping. Now, none of us know for sure, none of us know for sure, um, you know, which level is going to be manipulated. But when prices came to here, yeah, you could see that there were traders that were looking to get involved here. You saw a nice little engulfing candle probably some sort of double top on the lower time frame of traders look to the left because they're told to look to the left and uh you've got nice um support support should turn to what resistance so then what you get is you get traders getting in short on probably double tops on the one hour maybe if on a lower time frame it would have looked a bit better and then you get a stop hunt at the top here and then you get a move down does that make sense just above this level yeah Right. But then, then when you look at this from an hourly perspective, yeah, it's like a stop hunt. But if we were to go up to, for example, four hour, would you think these four hourly guys, where are they placing their stop losses? Above that stop hunt there. Now, the question is, as far as what, what, what we don't know is, where is the liquidity? How much liquidity do, do the financial institutions need in order to push prices to the downside? So on a four hour time frame chart or a higher time frame chart, that would have looked much more accurate, right? So it's already got the hourly traders. Now we've got the four hour traders, two candles swing, where are they placing their stop losses above the market? So everybody who trades pretty much intraday time frame charts now is still looking at this level. And even the hourly time frame traders are probably saying, oh, that was just a, a, maybe a, a false breakout and look at this now. They're, they're more convinced. So then they start to pile in even more short. Whereas, you know, where are the orders above that market there? Because that looks like now it's going to go. So what it does is it does one more stop hunt. Yeah, clears out the traders. Also, as it clears out the traders, it draws in more traders to the upsides. Yeah, the breakout traders who now are thinking to themselves that level's definitely gone. Support, support, resistance. 
Look at that close above. Brilliant. So it's drawn in the traders to the upside. And then what it does as well is obviously um, uh, taking out all the stops. On a lower time frame, what does that look like? Retracement traders getting in. And then you get what is known as the stop hunt candle. And we're away. Because the market really wanted to go. So well, I say that now, but um, from, from, from a probabilistic nature, if you're looking at Europe and the US, yes, they're both struggling fundamentally because well, everyone's struggling with this coronavirus. Everyone is. But again, I always say who's best placed? Yeah, in the lead up to this uh, coronavirus, the US were head and shoulders above Europe. So it only, you know, uh, follows logic that if everyone's being dragged down by the coronavirus, who is going to be the best of the worst? So this was needed. Markets pulled back because there is, you know, liquidity that needs to be, uh, you know, buy. The financial institutions don't want to buy down here. They do not want to buy there. They want to buy, you know, at fair value. Yeah, it's between this line, it's high at low. Yeah, fair value. Or at least start buying at fair value if they figured that, um, you know, this was uh, definitely a bargain. The higher, obviously, it goes, the more of a bargain it is. None of us know. But the point being is that from a stop hunt perspective that we can get involved in, this would have been a difficult one. And the reason why that is is because what we typically want to see is something like this is, is more of a ranging market so if what i'm saying resonates with you why not check out trading180.com there is a selection process to trade my supply and demand zone forex strategy i'm only looking to work with uh, individuals with the right mindset you know who are hard working as well so um check that out and access really for less than one pound a day. This Some of the strategies in here are not for beginners. So if you don't know what supply and demand is, please check out all of my supply and demand videos. I have hundreds of videos on YouTube, so you can check that out first. Um, guys, take care and until the next video, have a good one.